get this out here. Uh, wait. Good morning. Terrific. How's everybody doing? Can we get a round of applause for that trailer and for Eli and what he's doing with Finn? So, um, delighted to be here uh, to be able to moderate this panel for this extraordinary project with two friends, Michael Muller and Eli Roth. Why don't you guys come on out? Michael Muller, uh, you know, they don't need an introduction, but of course, Michael Muller is one of the premier photographers in the world, not only for fashion and for movies and for media, but also has dedicated his life to telling stories about sharks and nature. Uh, and of course, Eli, you saw a little bit about what he's been up to with Finn, an extraordinary filmmaker in so many reasons, but my hero because of this film. So uh, let's jump into it, because I know we don't have a ton of time. We've got about a half an hour. And um, yeah, very excited. Very excited about this. Okay, terrific. Beautiful day, perfect time to talk about sharks. If I can open up my screen with some, a few of the questions here. So I wanted to kick it off, Eli, with you, of course. Um, you know, we're here in LA. Uh, we're gonna get to, I think, some, some, maybe some information that might shock some folks in the audience later, but let's start at the beginning. Why did you decide to do this film? Um, well, first, thanks everyone for being here, because obviously, you know, may, we spent five, five years making Finn, and it goes out there, but I made a movie that, to help people get want to care about sharks, because, you know, for years there's been so much fear propaganda about them, and, I, you know, I, look, I grew up in Boston, and Jaws was my favorite movie, and I was terrified to go in the water, and I was certain the sharks were going to eat me, and then someone from Discovery asked if I wanted, knew that I was like, had, I was into sharks and asked if I wanted to be a host of Shark After Dark on Shark Week, which is where I met your white, lovely wife, Ashlyn. Um, and I, they sent me on a dive. And it was one of those moments that instantly changed my life. I was I, literally, there are very few times that happens to you where there's a before and after that's instantaneous. I went in the water and I grew up with dogs and they were so much like dogs. They didn't want to bite me. I mean, they didn't care. It's a bit of an ego bruise. I was like, I guess I'm liking glorious bastards. No one cares. But they come by and they were so, I was so calm with them. I like them so much better than, you know, studio executives I have to deal with. And they were, it, it was amazing. I was feeding them by hand. I was like, I and mean, there's no cage. And then, so then I got addicted. And then I went diving with tiger sharks in Tahiti. And everyone's like, oh, the tiger sharks, they're so aggressive. No, these, th th it was like super zen. And you just kind of can like ninja. If they come up to you and you gently put your hand on them, they just are like, where's the fish? Where's the fish? They're like, that's all they care about. I had cut my hand underwater. I was like, it's going to, nothing. They could care less. You cut open a fish. They didn't race for it like the little fish did, but the sharks would just come over. And there, there was a social system. And then I met Michael, and he took me diving with great whites, which you're in a cage. But we're watching their mouths, and they're communicating with mouth gaping. And then I learned that 100 million a year are being killed. And I was like, how is that possible? And that's 11,000 an hour. So in the time you watch the movie, 18,000 sharks are gone. Then I learned that you know, in the last, God, since 2000, there's been almost 2.5 billion sharks taken out of the water. And I was like, why? I don't under, I'm not a scientist, but I've made horror movies. And I want to make, this is going to be the scariest movie I've ever made because it's real. But I don't want to make something that's so upsetting you feel just like helpless at the end. Because 50 years ago, we, you know, we got together to save the whales. Then we did it for dolphins. We did it for elephants and ivory. And it's, we, if we don't do it for sharks now, they, they won't be able to recover because they take 18 years to reach sexual maturity. And they're getting killed at such a crazy rate. But then when I learned about it, the food is the whole industry is a lie. And they spend billions of dollars making you afraid of sharks and spend billions to make you think it's sustainable. It's a lie. The, the soup has no flavor. It's eating fingernail. It's literally flavorless. There's a gelatin alternative that's identical. I taste both in the film. Uh, makeup, they put shark liver oil, squalene, that you have to demand that it's, there's a plant alternative that works exactly the same. These, this whole fake industry, I found out a guy wrote a book called Sharks Don't Get Cancer, which is bullshit, they do. Yeah. But he started selling shark cartilage pills. They're still sold at GNC. Amazon sells 300 kinds of different shark products. FedEx is shipping the fins. And the, the meat is mislabeled and sold at supermarkets all over the world, including the US. So everyone's like, it's just soup in China. It's not. 
we export sharks, we kill sharks, we sell them all over the world. So they said, well, you can't fin a shark anymore. You've got to land the whole shark. It's like you literally multiplied the problem by five. Instead of just making the soup, now you have this industry of the, the teeth with the jewelry, the cartilage, the liver, and they're all kind of blaming each other. So in the movie, I just wanted to go start to finish so someone who knows nothing about it. And then everyone's like, well, I'm never going to, I don't want to see sharks. Why should I care? Well, here's the problem. What the sharks do, keeping, not just keeping, we know about keeping the ocean in balance, but they eat the grouper, which eat the parrotfish, which eat the algae. Without sharks, you get algae blooms that are so bad, they turn the water to acid, you can't swim in it, and it blocks the kelp, which is producing our oxygen. So literally, our, half our oxygen is coming from the ocean, and the sharks are like the doctors of the sea. It's the equivalent of taking our doctors out of the ecosystem that affect everyone, you know, right, you know, even if you're landlocked, you're still getting oxygen. So I, I know it's a difficult conversation because people don't care about sharks. Nobody wants to get eaten by a shark. But I thought, you know what, if I, I like, I, I'm good at like scaring people. So if I can channel that power. But then I found out the, the worst thing that really made me sick was that Google Monster Shark Tournament, East Coast, up and down the East Coast, all over New York, Boston, Connecticut, Delaware. They are Rhode Island. They're killing sharks at these tournaments for fun, and they call it for sharing. No, there's no laws against it, but they have sponsors. They'll take sponsors that'll say Jeep or the Boston Bruins, and they go and go, hey, we're doing a charity event. And people go, yeah. And then you point out what it is. Some of them go, well, we're catch and release only now. Well, I learned what that is. You drag a shark 30 miles an hour behind a boat and release it, it drowns because it's released too much stress hormone. So the whole thing, if you ever see a shark out of the water, someone is making money from it. And it's great that there are companies like Walmart, like Toyota, that are starting to care and that, you know, we just need to basically, it's on us to, the only way it's going to change is with our dollars and if we go sharp free. I'll shut up. I'll talk the entire time. Sorry. <laughs> well. It's a lot bottled up after five years. Sorry. Yeah, I, you know, clearly um, you're not that passionate about this issue. And, I don't and care. Yeah. That's, we'll talk about that later. We need some work. Um, <laughs> So I wanted to start out, you know, you, you mentioned horror film. Uh, obviously, it's, it's a genre that you know very well. The film opens with a pretty gripping scene where you are boarding an illegal fishing vessel. Yes. And there are soldiers with guns. You know, it's clear that the folks on that ship are not happy that you're there. Did you expect to be in such a dangerous situation? I mean, these are, you know, black market illegal fishing vessels, yeah. lots of money at stake, a lot of people get killed and disappear, uh, you know, as they start to, you know, get their nose, you know, stick their noses yes. into this business. Did you expect that when you started this journey? What were you thinking as you're boarding that ship? There's guns, there's, you know, the very real possibility of death. Well, What's going through your mind? You know, there's, there's great filmmakers like Rob Stewart, who did Sharkwater and Sharkwater Extinction. Someone, he was a big inspiration to me. And also Gordon Ramsay did an episode on finning where he was, he was threatened. Um, so I knew that, and I know that this is black market. This is these are criminals that are part of the illegal, unreported, you know, fishing industry. So I went in with the Liberian Coast Guard and with Israeli special forces, but it was still incredibly dangerous. And the Minister of Defense of Liberia, who's in the movie, is amazing. They caught this Spanish fishing vessel that had been, and they were keeping it in port for us. And someone had already paid to release it. And we showed they do it all through shell companies. So you can't trace who actually owns this boat, Labico 2, which is a notorious poaching vessel. So they said, if you can get on the boat right now, we can hold it probably another couple of days. So I was in the middle of editing this movie for Amblin, The House with a Clock in Its Walls, which is like this kid's movie with Kate Blanchett and Jack Black. And I was like, I'll be right back. And I'm, they're like, where are you going? We have a test screening next week. I'm like, can we push it a few days? They're like, yeah, I'm like, I just need more time to edit. Meanwhile, I flew to Liberia, and I'm with Sea Shepherd, and I'm like, how do we do this? And they go, we've been on the boat. The last time we were on the boat, one of the people stabbed a soldier. And the problem is, these are, peop these are the poorest people in the world. I mean, the fishermen that are brought on these boats don't even know that it's illegal. The captain knows it's illegal, but they're basically, they go out for three years at a time, and they'll not pay them and throw them overboard. I mean, th these people, it is, it is true true slavery. So I'm like trying to be sympathetic to them, but I'm like, I've got to show what happens. So we get on this boat and, you know, immediately one guy starts screaming, I'm having a heart attack. Now, I know that generally when you have a heart attack, you probably don't scream, I'm having a heart attack. But <laughs> the guy starts riling up the other people. So the Israelis, you know, special forces guys, and military, they're like, 
if anyone gets shot, this is an international incident. We got to be very careful. We got to just keep going. Just get the foot, get your shots and get the hell out of here. So we get on the boat and they're like, what are you guys doing? Like we board, you know, they have like an AK-47 between me and the fishermen. And we're, we're all trying to like be like cool or yeah, we're just fine. But I went down in the freezer and saw all the dead sharks and it's minus 20 degrees and my skin is starting to freeze. And I hear screaming and we're like, oh my God. And I, but my thought was, well, I've pushed this too far. Like, I hate movies where I know how it is with people from Hollywood getting behind an issue. And I, I have that allergic reaction. And, and that's probably one of the things that prevented me from getting involved is that I don't want to be one of those douchebags. It's like, you shouldn't kill shark. You know, I can't, I can't do that. If I'm going to go in, I have to go to like the most dangerous part of the world myself and show it and show it all over where I am physically there. I'm in the fi I'm sitting down with the traders in Hong Kong. I'm at the bottom of the boat in Liberia. I'm out with Canada with the scientists. Like, I, and I couldn't tell anyone I was doing it because I didn't want people to know that I was making some pro shark movie. I'm with, with like, you, see, you know, the, the tournament guys. They, I had Joe Romero protecting me. These guys wanted to kill us in Boston after they filmed all day. We got releases and they Googled me and saw me with Shark Week petting sharks. They're like, this is going to be like, you know, Cecil the Lion kind of thing. So I did feel this thing of like, I just hope that I don't get anyone killed. Like, please don't let anyone kill because I did not, there's no recovering from that. I thought, I, maybe I've pushed this too far. Thank God we got out of there. It was diffused and we got the footage. It's a pretty amazing. It's both in the opening and then the longer segment later in the film. So if anybody hasn't seen it, it's edge of your seat. Um, Michael, yeah. you've been at this a long time. We've yeah. been diving together. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. You don't come from a background of conservation, uh, ocean exploration. Uh, I mean, everybody knows Michael, one of the most talented photographers in the world. How did you get involved in shark conservation? What, what, what inspired you? Well, uh, first thing I want to say is thank you all for being here. Um, I'm glad that we can be in a room all together, semi-safe. Uh, I see a lot of smiles, which is great. Um, yeah, I, my favorite movie was Star Wars, and Jaws scared the shit out of me as a kid. Excuse my language. Uh, so we have a little bit in common. Yeah. I thought the shark was going to come out of the light in my pool. And if you're my age, you probably felt the yes. same. Yes. All right. Um, I got into sharks because I grew up in Northern California where the water's cold surfing and saw jaws. So every time I was out, I was just thinking this thing was going to come up. Yeah, a huge fear. And, you know, about 20 years ago, I'm like, I want to see a shark. I want to go photograph it. I want to look at it. And uh, I went down to Guadalupe. And just like Eli, the first, I was in the water, I was the first one in the cage at like 5.30 in the morning, out of the dark, five minutes in, great white comes by me. We lock eyes. And I'm like, oh, you're not Jaws, you're this. My life changed in that moment, just seeing the eyes. Because they have like iris, they have like human eyes, but most of the time you don't see it, they look black and soulless. But they actually look at you and you, you see them. It's not like other fish. Uh, yeah. It's like Jurassic Park, being eye to eye with a T-Rex and the size of the head, and they're just looking at you, examining. I mean, really, you have the most incredible, incredible experience. Um, yeah, I was, I was hanging out of the cage by my waist on that first trip and wanted, wanted to get out there, which eventually I didn't. And to give you all, like, if you haven't been diving with Great Whites, it's, it's important to understand we're talking about 15 footers easily. Uh, and it's not just the length of these things. It's how big around they are. That's what's often, I think, lost until you're actually down there. I mean, it's, they're the girth. enormous. The girth. They're yeah. enormous um, and very imposing until, you know, we've all had this experience now on the stage where you look them in the eye and you can see their, the pupil and they're looking at you. They're not just this black hole of death. Their eyes are scanning you and looking at you. And some of the sharks are curious. Some of them are a little bit more, you know, uh, confident. Some of them kind of hang back. Um, and to have different personalities, and, and you really see that come through. And so, so you had this life-changing experience, and then that kind of from there shot you on this trajectory of writing books and being an advocate for sharks now for, for years. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I wasn't aware. I was really naive about what was happening in our oceans. And nine months after that trip, I went down to the Galapagos with uh, uh, IWC watches, which is at the time they're the first green watch factory. And I went down with the Charles Darwin Foundation, UNESCO, and that's where I found out we were killing 100 million sharks. Half the Great Barrier Reef was gone. Like, just, I don't know, I have three daughters, and I was up on the boat one night under all the stars, and I'm like, I don't think my girls are going to be able to see the things that I'm seeing. Um, and what am I going to do about it? Because unlike uh, Eli's, I mean, like Eli's comment about people that just sort of go for causes, I'm a... I like to put my footwork into it. So I, I made a decision at that time. I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can 
to help raise awareness and raise money for sharks, that specific thing. Because uh, there's so many issues in our oceans and on our planet, as I think we're all aware of today. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you, you, I just felt like that was the thing. And I had just invented, I actually got four patents on bringing strobe lights underwater. So I knew I could shoot these animals in a way, because like Philippe was saying, 15, they're more like 17, 18 foot, especially the, the girls, the female sharks. They're the, they're the bosses, <laughs> which is great, just like in my home. Yeah. Um. <laughs> well, what, you know what you're saying, first, and obviously I don't mean to knock any, anyone that has a cause and wants to be passionate about it, yeah. you know, go for it. Um, I do think that, you know, what you said about being an activist, you know, I, I think that what I realized through this experience, because I set out to make horror movies, and then acting happened, and other things, and I was like, oh, I actually, I have a voice, but what I've realized is that everybody has a voice and I don't mean just railing on Twitter, it's your dollars. And your dollars are your voice. And what you said about your kids not being able to see sharks, I thought, you know, like, I, I didn't, I, I sort of stumbled into activism. I never, I had this, like, shame about it that I was like, well, these people are smarter than me, and they're scientists, and I'm not qualified to do this. And then I thought, well, I can tell stories, so I can learn. And I think that there is a thing that you sort of have to get over of, like, I used to think, eh, Leo's got it. He's taking care of it. I'm good. <laughs> but the truth is that, you know, it is going to be, it is all of our problem that we've all inherited and we've all been a part of. And we need to just not point fingers and not blame and go, okay, we're in a mess. What are we going to do? But if you think about all the different problems, you get overwhelmed. But like with shark activism, it's one thing. If you want to go after the makeup industry, just go after the industries, the products you like going, is your squalene because there's squalene that makes lipstick shiny. Is it plant-based or is it shark-based? Will you label it shark-free? Will you label it shark-free? The tournaments, we had people that went after the sponsors of the tournaments last year is going, going, why are you paying for this? They're killing sharks. This isn't fun. <laughs> this is like, do you know that they're using your logo? Half the sponsors didn't even know that their logos were being used in the tournament. Other people, the, you know, FedEx is still shipping shark fins, FedEx. DHL stopped, FedEx hasn't. Like, will you please stop shipping the fins? Just, just, you can segregate it, but like also GNC, they're still selling it, you know, still selling the shark, the shark cartilage pills. So everybody's voice matters. It's just how you consciously spend your dollars. Um, and that was the reason was I made a movie was that, you know, and Discovery was, uh, and Lionsgate were incredible and Discovery Plus, they put it on Shark Week. And now with Discovery Plus merging with HBO Max, hope, you know, more people will be able to see it. But I just wanted people in 90 minutes to understand the problem and go, oh, this is solvable. It does matter to me, but for our kids and for the next generation, we have to, like 50 years ago, I'm telling you, we saved the whales. We used to kill whales all the time and label them as monsters. We used to hunt gorillas and you know, kill elephants for their tusks, and we've stopped it. I mean, they're still poaching, but it's not an industry anymore, and we have to do that for sharks. And just know, the forces against sharks are so great because they're making billions killing them. And there's absolute, and we, they belong to you. The sharks belong to all of us, and they belong to none of us. And they belong to your kids. So if someone is killing a shark and telling you it's sustainable, they're making money, and it's a lie. Yeah, I, I, it's, um, I think it's, it drives to the heart so much. We'll dig in this a little bit more. What impact, I think, is all about, right? Understanding yeah. what are the externalities. I mean, part of the reason that fisheries in general, which is, which is something I want to get to here, are profitable in many cases is because of subsidies, right? They're, they're circumventing yes. the externalities and the true cost of these products um, in order to subvert that price and make it more affordable. Um, so one of the issues that you talk about in the film is the subsidies, the issue of subsidies in fisheries. I think this is gonna be shocking for a lot of people in the audience here. Talk to us a little bit about how we have this perverse incentive to continue, and we're not just talking sharks, we're talking oh, it's, krill it's, for uh, krill oil, omega-3s. I'm gonna throw this out there, it's a big issue that we're working on right now. It's not just sharks. Look, when you go home, look at the supplements, look at your products, your chondroitin, your glucosamine, things like that, is oftentimes shark cartilage. Your omega-3 pills might be fish or krill, um, when there are algae-based alternatives. So, you know, there's a massive industry that is destroying the ocean and being funded by us to do it and by government. It's horrible. Really shocking. It's so sickening because mm -hmm. I'm in Africa and Liberia, and we go to this, first we get on this boat, then we go to this village, Robertsport, which is a fishing village and actually been a surfing village before Ebola. So in Robertsport, they used to be catching fish. We're the fishermen, they're catching fish this big and starving. 
And they're like, what happened? Well, the Chinese boats came in and these European boats and they just vacuum up the floor. Like in 18 days, they can decimate a population. And then I'm like, well, who's, and these are illegal vessels that are, the, okay, who's paying for it? EU. I was like, what? The EU subsidizes it. Parliament in the EU, the politicians are paid by the fishing industry. The fishing industry has bought off our fucking politicians. And then I was like, well, don't the European, part, blah, blah. and then Lily looked at it, and it's Japan and the US is like number two or number three in subsidizing this. Our politicians are fucking us. They are completely, the lobbyists, they, have, they are bought off by the fishing industry. And the only way it's gonna stop is if we stop buying the products and drive the demand to zero. I couldn't believe it. So you look at, because you think, well, this is the China problem. It's not. Like, how do these boats get from Europe to Africa to steal all the fish to then sell it in high-end restaurants all around the world? And they're just vacuuming them up. It's subsidized because the, the tax dollars pay for it. I just, it. The whole thing is so corrupt. And then you talk to the politicians, and the politicians are like, and we have them. We have the footage going, there's no problem. Like, you could see them. like They're on C-SPAN going, this is totally sustainable. This is an overreaction. We shouldn't ban. Shark fishing is totally fine. Like People going out and killing sharks for fun is totally legal. There's Shark Allies is working hard to ban it in Florida. Florida is the number one exporter of fins and shark. It's just like I'm the shocked. politicians are I'm so, shocked. I'm blown away. But really? Well, <laughs> but there's people there that they're close to getting it. I mean, like DeSantis, they were almost passing it. Like it's, it's moving through where it actually might benefit. But, but what's so crazy is this. Like even from an economic level, something that I learned that I show in the film, one shark dead, one time use, mm -hmm. is probably going to get the fishermen $20 or $30. The Bahamas has made it a sanctuary. So if the shark's in the Bahamas, it's safe. One shark, one, is worth $250,000 in dive tourism over its lifetime. $250,000 for one shark. And we're killing 11,000 an hour. If anyone with half a brain wanted to start an industry, and everybody wants to dive with them, like start dive tourism, which is what some of these villages are doing. I show one beach, that beach in, in Mexico where you see where they're beating to death with baseball bats, which is crazy. The beach bordering it flipped to dive tourism and everybody has money and it's evergreen and the reef completely rebounded. Like what's so insane is that this isn't like, oh, we're gonna, fishermen are gonna starve to death, we stop killing sharks. If we help people, if you put money, instead of subsidizing killing the sharks, if we subsidized helping villages turn into green eco-tourism, it is evergreen and everybody benefits and the planets and then our grandkids have something left. It's just like the, the, the solutions are so mind-numbingly simple, it just takes the public having a voice about it. You know, one of the things in addition to that that really frustrates me, and, and Michael, I know you've experienced this, so I want you to talk a little bit about um, what you've seen is that in many ways, these people you pointed out, Eli, are, are poverty stricken. So the impacts of fishing sharks is having real world impacts on people's lives. Oh yeah. Massive, massive. Uh, you know, in, in off the coast of Africa, uh, not only do they, they drop uh, explosives to just get all the fish up from the reefs, just net them up. And what happens is the villagers there with their families and they're, they have to keep going out, 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 out. There's no fish. Um, you know, when I was in the Galapagos uh, about three years ago, uh, there was a boat, an uh, illegal fishing boat, that had, I forget how many tons, but they had a pregnant whale shark in there. I mean, pregnant whale shark, <laughs> just was, was wild. Uh, Fiji, I don't know if I'm supposed to out corporations here, but what I found out was that Mitsubishi has oh, the yeah. stockade of bluefin tuna. They They've got a 10-year supply. They paid a million five for this one bluefin. They want it to go extinct because Yeah, Mitsubishi they can... is cornering the market on bluefin tuna. They're killing Mitsubishi. them all and freezing them so that they have the entire world supply. Absolutely. Mitsubishi, think when you buy your cars, when you buy your televisions. Yeah, maybe you'll choose Toyota. They're so. cornering the world market on bluefin tuna. No one's calling them out on it. And by the way, you can't eat shark. It's got 32 times, I mean, like, the level of mercury. It's not even tested before it goes in supermarkets. And they so, must make freezers, because I'm like, why does the car company want bluefin tuna? Yeah. <laughs> you know, crazy. one of my favorite stories about this issue is um, we're all familiar with the Somali pirate piracy issue going back decades. Well, in the 90s, when Somalia, as a failed state, was unable to enforce its fisheries, you had illegal fishing boats coming in from Europe, the United States, Russia, China, 
and pulling about $100 million worth of fish illegally out of Somali waters every year. All of these ships subsidized, by the way, by the EU, when with one hand they're doing fisheries conservation, just like the US, US and, and Japan. And the fishermen who had subsisted for millennia on those fisheries turned to piracy to try and fight off these illegal shipping, yep. uh, these fishing vessels. And I have a, a copy of a Department of Defense report that talks about this as a case study. The entire Somali piracy crisis was caused by overfishing and illegal fishing. Uh, and it drove these people to arm themselves to try and protect their fishing lands. Then you had Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations arm them with more sophisticated equipment and take a cut of the profits from the um, uh, 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 hijackings. And so you have the summary of this DOD report is for a few million dollars of fisheries conservation work, hundreds of thousands of lives that have been ruined, thousands, hundreds of billions of dollars spent and lost. Um, all of that could have been avoided for a few million dollars of fisheries conservation. And so it gets to this point. You see these people in Liberia that you visited, Eli, Michael, in Africa and places that you've been whose lives have been devastated mm -hmm. by these large-scale fishing vessels going in. So we're talking human rights. We're talking people being able to feed their families. We're talking the conservation of the oceans. I mean, this is a massive, and massive you, issue. And you don't realize that it's like you're eating fish in a nice restaurant. You're not connecting it to someone. It was taken from some villager in Liberia. And I talked to them about it. And they said that, you know, basically Sea Shepherd came in because, the like, the U.S. Army was there. And they were mad that I, we were there because... Sea Shepherd went and trained the Liberian soldiers when the army went. The army wanted to keep them without guns. So Sea Shepherd came in and protected the waters and literally like went after the boats. But they told me the fishermen, like you said, army themselves, the fishermen would row out to the Chinese or other you know, European fishing vessels and they would blast them with boiling water. So they couldn't even get close. As soon as they got close, they would hit them with boiling. The Chinese water. ships would hit them. Yeah, they would the just fishermen. they would just blast boiling water on them. So it was like that you you couldn't fight it. Yeah, I mean and, you can't fight a massive. You know, one of one of the things that Eli said it, earlier, you know? which is so important, is your dollars. Because yeah. here's here's the reality, you've got to pass laws. These are international waters, so it's really hard to get every country on board. You've got to pass laws. Then you have to have enforcement of these laws, which means you know, uh, Navy, and et cetera, which a lot of these countries don't have. So how do you stop this problem that really isn't a solution to solve with your dollars and your buying sense? Because when you start telling these companies, we don't want that anymore, they start hearing you and they're, oh, we can use this. And then all you need is one, one big one, domino, yeah. and then the others will follow. Well, that's what I learned with CITES, you know, the, for the society, you know, the, committed the endangered trade, it's, it's regulating the trade of endangered species, which to us is insane, but is a thing. And they're like, well, if it's Appendix 1, if Appendix 2, Appendix 3, there are different levels of how endangered, okay, you can't kill a whale shark, you can't kill great whites, but the blues are fine. But the whole thing, the whole system of how they judge them, I had the friends that went to try and get short fin makos put on, and Canada rejected it, because they were like, well, we're fine in Canada, not taking into account that Sharks are pelagic and roam the entire planet. The day they counted that day, there were enough. Like, they're paid off. Like, the whole thing is corrupt. There shouldn't be any. There should be zero sharks out of the water. No bluefin. Zero. Also, I know it's very popular. No, Goro no and all that better. stuff. And so it would be on CITES if it wasn't for Japan as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. So they're paid off. They're corrupt. Mitsubishi's obviously paid. It's like the whole thing is it's, it's literally the only thing that's going to change it is a conscious effort. Like, we don't eat panda. You know, because it's crazy. It's sort of we need that mentality with shark that when you're in GNC and you see these pills, you have to go, you can't sell this. And publicly go, why are you doing this? Like, this is contributing to it. We're not going to buy it. Like, and, don't and buy it. And support this. companies. I mean, that's part of support well, and investing support companies, companies that are doing alternatives. Because yeah. I guarantee you, if they're using vegan squalene, it's on the label. Yeah. It's, if, it's plant based. If they're not, it's the same thing. they're yeah. just not going to talk about it, right? Yeah. You'll have squalene there and they won't talk about it. So it's a pretty easy thing to determine. If uh, if you're looking at vegan products, yeah, the right liver, liver oil, they won't say that it's shark. Uh, you have a scene in the film too that if this does not like turn your stomach, where they you show them and how they're rendering the oil out of the shark livers on this disgusting, foully dirty ship, it's it was crazy. We we I went in the bowels of the most. I was like, this is hell. Like it's the most. I mean, for me, it was like a shark lover. It's like inside the guts of one of, of this ship, this illegal shark ship. And they're taking these leaf scale gulper sharks, a threatened species that are this big, and they're just sucking thousands and thousands of them, slicing them open, throwing them, and dropping the liver into this hole. So I was like, what's down there? And we go down there, 
And it's it's like it's just like something out of Eraserhead, like some disgusting factory. Sorry, I was too nerdy a film reference. It's like some disgusting super pit. It's like this slimy. It smells so bad. And the guy like turns this rancid faucet, and this black bile comes out that smells like awful. I'm like, it's that. And he goes, oh, it's worse than there. And I look in, and I'm like, I try to. My God, if I could have filmed Hostel there, I try to recreate. I, w I want to take pictures as reference to rebuild this for a horror movie. I like worse than any horror dungeon I could dream up. You open it up, and it's this rusted, corroded, shitty thing. And I go, what goes in there? They go, that's where we dump the oil. And then it gets sucked up out of a tube. And I go, what happens to it then? And I show the commercials. Yeah, the commercials. And the commercials are like, it's this beautiful, clean Australian girl, like and J Japanese, and people rubbing it into their face for the moisturizer. They're like all natural, sustainably sourced, totally healthy, great for your skin. And it's like showing what it does. It's like taking this disgusting from like the ass of this boat and spraying it onto people's face in the name of health. I was like, this is, and that's why like I was going crazy and I couldn't tell anyone. And they're like. You know, so, so, so I hear you like sharks. I'm like, no, 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 Like, I couldn't even contain it. It's, the whole thing was so mind numb. Like, when I sat down, you know, with, with the, in the restaurant, and they're killing these sharks. I mean, the, the shark fins are dried on rooftops, like, literally out with dog shit in the street. They dry it. It's the most disgusting thing. Then they have to scrape it and spray it with bleach. The bleach doesn't wash out. They're fucking, it's the same shit you put in your clothes. They're scrubbing into the fin to get it to look white. Then they rehydrate it, and then it doesn't taste like anything because it's basically cartilage, it's fingernail. Then they put chicken stock and pig stock, and then there's a fish, and it just tastes like a weird crunch. And I go, and then it's $100 a bowl. I was like, if you're putting bleach in this, you're leaving it with dog excrement, you're putting it with bleach, it actually has no flavor. Why are people And it's full of mercury. Full of mercury, neurotoxins. You want to talk about dementia, impotence, like all of that stuff. You want your sexual organs to not work? Eat shark. Then they're like, you want to kill, like, you want to like damage your children in the womb? Eat shark. And then they eat it, and I go, why would people eat it? And they go, because it's expensive. And yeah. you're just like, I give up. Man. I go, Listen, I, we've, we're almost out of time here. I, I'm looking up at the clock. I'm realizing, oh, crap. Um, we have time maybe for one question, if somebody has a question uh, here in the audience. Yes. It's hard. Oh, oh this is a yeah, big so problem. I just want to repeat that yeah. for everybody. How do we get the government, how do we get individuals to care about these kinds of issues when like, it's hard enough to get them to care about land animals that we're, you know, we're connected to every day? Uh, and, and as a corollary to that, I'm just going to ask, where can we watch Finn? It's on Discovery Plus streaming. Okay. So uh, um, I, it's a great question. And that was a big problem. Because elephants, koala bears, they have faces. And you can relate to them. You can't relate to a shark. It's like you know the way. It, it, and by the way, we're not supposed to see them. We're not supposed to interact. We're not, like, you've swam by sharks every time you go in the water, you just don't know it. Mm -hmm. You know, 90, every day, no one's gonna write a story, a shark did nothing today, but you know, if six <laughs> people die from a shark bite, that's sensationalism, and the fishing industry loves it, because it allows people to keep killing them. I think that all we can do, that's why if you, you will get overwhelmed, and that's, what you're hitting on is exactly what the fishing industry is counting on. They're counting on us to get so caught up and upset feeling embarrassed that we care about sharks when there's school shootings. They're like, they want us to feel that way. They want us to feel small, they want us to feel helpless, and they want us to feel like, there's so much else to worry about, why do you care about sharks? Because they're making billions doing it. So the less we pay attention, and the more we dismiss it, and we have dismissed it, now they're gone. They're gonna be gone in 10 years. So if that's why, like to get people to care, you can go, you don't have to like sharks, but you like clean water, you like going to the beach, and you like oxygen, and you care about having a safe place, healthy oceans, they are the doctors of the sea. Yeah. You don't want to go to the hospital, but we, don't, we, we care about those doctors. Getting children to relate, and maybe I have to make some kind of black stallion shark movie to get people to care, 
Getting children to care about sharks is very hard, but it's on us to say they're actually keeping our air safe and our water clean. It's going to be just education. Well, thank you both so much. Using, you know, I really just want to point out the authenticity you talked about, Eli, earlier, and Michael, of how you both dedicated your your career, your your reputations, your authenticity, your social capital to really digging into this kind of issue. I wish more people in this creative industry did that with the kind of aplomb and commitment that you have. Thank you all. I think number one, the first step is that you all came here today. Yes. Yeah. Our, Thank you our, all. We all have a superpower, and it's storytelling. And every single one of us has the opportunity to go and spread the message for this. Watch Finn. Wa have your friends watch Finn. Have your family watch Finn. And become evangelists and storytellers for this global crisis that affects every single one of us. And it's connected to climate and human rights and slavery and all of these issues. So thank you both for joining us today. Thank you, for Emma, for, for convening thank this you, gathering. Yeah. Uh, we're running a few minutes late, so I will leave it at that and say uh, have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, man.